Our scripture this reading this morning will be from Acts chapter 11. And if you would please stand while we read. <clears throat> now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them to all remain faithful to the Lord, and with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit of faith. And the great many people were added to the Lord, so Barnabas went to Tarsus and to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Please be seated. of Jesus, how he laid down his life at the cross for us, and yet he took it again. He lives, and we serve a risen Lord. And we praise God for that. This year, uh, Edwin and I are wanting to spend some time preaching about the church and to be encouraged about the church. And to do that, we've started a series going through the book of Philippians, the other way we're going to do that is to do a series where each month we're going to choose one New Testament church, one congregation, and take a lesson or lessons from that to apply to ourselves. And that's the series I want to start with you this morning. I want to look with you to Acts chapter 11 and talk about Antioch, God's grace on display. Talking about the church at Antioch as we read about its beginning in Acts chapter 11. What does grace look like? When do you know that you're witnessing the grace of God? And what's so exciting about Acts chapter 11 is that Barnabas saw it. Barnabas knew what it looked like. He told folks what it looked like. Talked about how he came into Antioch. And this is a picture of what the city looked like in the first century, as archaeologists believe. Third largest city in Rome at the time. A population of 300,000 or 400,000. Barnabas walks into that town and it, it, it was not, though the scripture says, it was not the, the beauty of the columns or the... Uh, beauty of the art or any of the other commerce that he's impressed with and yet he did see the grace of God. He was so impressed by the grace of God that he left the city of Antioch and he traveled to find Saul of Tarsus. He told him about the grace of God and convinced him, why don't you come back with me to Antioch and work with me and preach with me. Barnabas knew what the grace of God looked like. In Acts chapter 15 it is Barnabas along with Paul who described the grace of God to a Jerusalem council and helped them to understand that God's grace was on display in many churches and in many places beyond Jerusalem. When do you know you are witnessing the grace of God? The Holy Spirit tells us Barnabas saw the grace of God at a church in Antioch. Does that surprise you? That it was seen in a church? Maybe sometimes we are tempted today to say, well, I mean, I, I think I, I know what the grace of God looks like when we want to go through a time of counting our blessings. Say, well, I'm pretty sure I see the grace of God in that. Or think about how we learn the gospel and our conversion, becoming a Christian, and we, we, we can see the grace of God in that. Maybe we're tempted to think about the grace of God individually, but at church, maybe that's a different concept. Many believers are tempted today to look upon churches, I fear, with low expectations. 
I, I might see hypocrisy in a church, or I might find judgmentalism in a church, or maybe self-righteousness in a church, but, but see the grace of God? And maybe that's because we've had some previous experiences, even disappointments with God's people. Maybe that's because churches are full of people after all. And people will fail and people will disappoint us. And that's painful when that happens. Maybe you've been a part of a church and, and you know what? There really were spiritually abusive leaders there. Or there was false doctrine being taught in that place. Or there was factions. There was divisions in that church. And it has colored your view of church, any church, ever since. But I want you to appreciate this morning that if we close our eyes to the church, if we look away from the church, if we leave the church, we're going to miss God's grace. We're not going to witness God's grace on display. We're going to miss out on God's grace, and I don't want to miss out on God's grace to you. I don't want to miss out on that. Acts chapter 11, verse 23. Here's, a, here's another archaeologist's picture of what that city looked like. Acts 11, verse 23 says, When he, when Barnabas came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad. And I want you to feel glad in your heart. I want you to feel glad to be a part of a church. And I hope today in this lesson, I hope in this series to refresh our eyes so that we see the grace of God on display in his church. And Barnabas and the church at Antioch orient our sight, orient our heart to see God's grace on display. Barnabas and the church at Antioch help us to appreciate the grace of God that we have as being a part of his church. That we have it being a part of this church right here, this church at Livingston. And to stand in that grace. And to serve God in that grace. When we see the church, we see God's grace on display. When we see the church at Antioch, we see God's grace on display. Number one in your notes, we see God's grace displayed in fellowship. And in Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 21, what a picture we have of fellowship. Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. But some of them who were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists preaching the Lord Jesus and the hand of the Lord was with them and a great number believed and turned to the Lord you see where the grace of God is there is fellowship joint participation shared allegiance that's fellowship this church at Antioch is such a special church that we read about in the New Testament what we have here is these fellows who were Greek speaking Jews proselytes Gentiles and they're all learning the gospel, and they're all becoming Christians, sharing fellowship in Christ. They're one body, one church, one people. And Antioch is the first church in the New Testament that's like that, where you see both Jews and Gentiles all come together as one church. It's remarkable. It's remarkable that these Jewish Christians begin to reach out to the Greeks with the word, verse 20 says, preaching that Jesus is Christ, Jesus is Lord, I say it's remarkable because, because the Apostle Peter preached that way back in the uh, first gospel sermon, the book of Acts, right? In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, when he's preaching on the day of Pentecost, he says there that uh, he tells the people to repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off. As many as the Lord our God will call. He preached it on that day that the gospel's for you, but people who are far off. He preached it. That was true. But we don't see them immediately going and practicing it. Going and speaking to Gentiles about it. As you go on in the book of Acts, you come to the 10th chapter, you find that the apostle Peter himself had three visions from the Holy Spirit uh, uh, and, and then witness the Holy Spirit falling on Gentiles before he was convinced. Oh yeah, the gospel's for all people. It's, it's for the Gentiles too. And how Peter even wrestled with the idea of Gentiles being part of the church and Gentile fellowship. It reared its ugly head and we read about it in Galatians 2 verses 11 and 12 when Peter spent some time at this church at Antioch where there were Jews, where there were Gentiles together together. 
However, you have these brethren at Antioch that we just read about. And it doesn't say that they had a vision. It doesn't say that they saw a miraculous outpouring to the Holy Spirit. And yet they had the word of Christ. And they began talking to it to everyone, to other people. And the Lord rewarded that effort. We read in Acts chapter 11 and verse 21, how a great number believed and turned to the Lord. And news of this fellowship, news of this church where it's Jews and Greeks together, boy, that was quite the talk. I mean, word traveled fast. Word travels fast among brethren, even before the days of Facebook. Word traveled fast. In verse 22, we read about how that word came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. And what did they do? They sent out Barnabas there to go as far as Antioch. He saw the grace of God when he saw this special fellowship. He went and got Saul of Tarsus and Saul comes and they're working together there. We read that. You know, later on, the Apostle Paul would write about the power of the fellowship of Christ in a number of his epistles. Write about how through Christ the gospel has the power to call different people and fashion them into one body, into one church, to make them united, to make them as one. Passages like Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 13 through 16 show us how that in the gospel fellowship with Christ is offered regardless of the tribe, the language, even the religion that someone previously had. He talks about this idea of one body, Jews and Gentiles united in one body, one church in Ephesians 2 and verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You've been far from God, far from the ways of God, but now you're near. Now you're part of him. For he himself is our peace, who's made both one, Jews and Gentiles, he's made them all one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, and thereby putting to death the enmity. There were things that were dividing people. You say, well, in this context, it's talking about Jews and Gentiles. In this context, it's talking about two becoming one. Why do you got three things on your list? You said tribe and you said language, you said religion. What's that all about? Well, uh, from the Jewish perspective, tribes is, well, you're either Jewish or you're other. All the different tribes falls under the heading of Gentile, right? Gentile. And what about language? Well, the Jews spoke Hebrew. People knew some other language, but that was their language. And what did all the Gentiles speak? Uh, Latin, Greek, Aramaic, all these sorts of things. And religion. Well, the Jews were practicing the law of Moses, keeping the Ten Commandments and all of that. What were the Greeks and the Gentiles practicing? Paganism, idolatry, all these things. Everyone already had a religion. They were called out of all these things into a unity to one body in Christ. In Christ. This fellowship is offered with Christ regardless of the education somebody has. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 10, Paul wrote about it there to the church at Colossae, that you've put on a new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him, where there's neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. I wrote education because what's a barbarian? It's a fellow that couldn't read or speak the language of the land. The uneducated, those are the barbarians. But you're offered to come be part of Christ. You're offered fellowship in Christ regardless of social standings. In this same verse it says it doesn't matter if you're slave or free. Come be a part of Christ. Be invited into this fellowship. One other place I'll take you in Paul's writings in Galatians 3 and verse 26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ... There's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you are one in Christ Jesus. Even regardless of sex, you are invited into this fellowship of Christ. Andrew, why are you taking us through all this? Paul wrote all of this because it's inspired of the Holy Spirit. Paul wrote all of it because it's true, it's God's word. God gave it to him to write. God only speaks truth. He wrote all of this. But where did he see it? Where did he see it 
first? Where did he see it with his own eyes? Where was the grace of God on display in this fellowship first? At Antioch. He saw it at Antioch. And likewise, the local church today is a fellowship of people who are different in many ways. But God's design is to heal and to unite people by the power of the gospel in one fellowship. We are all sinners before him. And yet we have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have obeyed and repenting of our sins and being baptized into Christ. We are saved by the blood of Christ and the Lord has added us to his church. And so there is no place in his church for pride, for partiality, for prejudice. And the grace of God is on display when a church stands together in unity. The gospel of Jesus unites a people. You see, in the world, Satan uses these things. In the world, Satan uses pride and partiality and prejudice to keep people divided. To keep people full of animosity and hate. To keep people acting out in violence and in vengeance. But the church is a fellowship of people who have turned all of that over to Jesus. And they no longer make their identity about their past. Whatever was in that past. The good, the bad, the ugly. The identity is no longer about the past. They make their identity about the future. And the future is Christ. And it makes you glad to know that Jesus has paid the price for all of that past, whatever was behind. And he covers all of that past with his grace and with his mercy and his forgiveness. And he does that for me and he does that for you so that he can bring us together as one, so that we can be his church and he can show us how to live together and have fellowship through his word. And when we witness people together like this in the local church, what you're seeing is the grace of God on display. God's grace is on display in fellowship. But a second aspect, sight of God's grace, is found here in Acts chapter 11. And that is God's grace is displayed in fidelity. God's grace is displayed in fidelity. In Acts chapter 11, in verse 23... It says in verse 22 that Barnabas had gone to Antioch. Verse 23. And when he had ca- came, excuse me, and when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad. And encouraged them all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. You see where the grace of God is, there is faithfulness. There is fidelity. The idea of loyalty to God. That faith is not just mental assent to uh, information God reveals us, but is even a trust and a commitment of our will. And we hold on to it. Fidelity. Fidelity means faithfulness to a person, a cause, or belief demonstrated by continuing loyalty and support. Now isn't that what we're seeing Barnabas encourage him to? He said encourage him in purpose of heart. He encouraged them to continue with the Lord. This is fidelity. Fidelity in the face of external persecution. What we know about the history of God's people, and particularly in the first three centuries, is that there was intermittent persecution. And whether it was coming out of the synagogues of the Jews against the early church, or whether it was even coming from the government powers, there was external persecutions. You can't even read about the travels of the apostles in the book of Acts without finding beatings, stonings, People being imprisoned, imprisoned, and all for the cause of Christ. Those kinds of persecutions might discourage people from continuing on with the Lord. Those kinds of persecutions might cause people to, to be quiet, to hide out, to quit altogether. We are so blessed, brethren, I don't think we understand it. Such a unique time and place in history that we actually have a freedom of religion in this country. A freedom to, to boldly proclaim our faith and to practice it. With fear, without fear, rather, of the authority. That is such a minority spot in all of the history of God's people and in all of his church. It's such a blessing. We need to praise God for that. It doesn't mean that there can't be persecutions. It doesn't mean that people won't hate you for standing for the truth, speak evil and revile against you falsely. It can't mean that there won't even be costs to pay, perhaps in your occupation or other commerce. I I don't know all the different wiles of the devil to turn up the fires of persecution against God's people. All I know is he's done it more or less for a couple of thousand years. 
And we need to resolve ourselves to be faithful to the Lord. And when we see a church standing together in fellowship and fidelity, despite external persecutions, that's God's grace on display. You're seeing the grace of God. Despite external persecution, they are faithful. And despite internal disputes, they are faithful. I mentioned a moment ago in passing about how the Apostle Peter struggled for a time, it would seem, with the idea that Gentiles and Jews could all be together uh, in one church, at least in practicing it. Uh, the Holy Spirit really worked with him to get that through. And you read about it in the conversion of Cornelius. Be that as it may, Peter wasn't the only one. We find out that one of the very first and challenging controversies facing God's people, his church, was whether or not Christians had to be circumcised and keep all the law of Moses, convert to Judaism, in order to be a Christian, in order to be saved. This is a very big deal, a very big issue. And the locus for this was this church at Antioch. We find out in the 14th chapter at the end, and the beginning of the 15th chapter of the book of Acts, how preachers went to Antioch from Jerusalem, and really troubled the saints there. Troubled this new church. In Acts chapter 15 and verse 1 it says. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren. These were the brethren in Antioch. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses. You cannot be saved. Therefore when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them. They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them. Should go to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. In verse 5, they find in Jerusalem, oh yeah, there were people who were starting to teach this. Verse 5, some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. How are we going to know about the truth of this doctrinal division? Well, a couple of things they did there that I think are great. They go back to the source of where this troubling teaching error came from. Well, it's coming out of Jerusalem. So they go to the source. Let's go talk to the people about this. And then they even begin talking to the apostles. Is this what the Holy Spirit gave you? Is this the true doctrine of the church? You can read all the chapter, but I'll tell you, kind of cut to the chase, no. Can I show you this? In Acts chapter 15 and verse number 24, the apostles decide what will fix this is a letter. We're going to set the record straight with the letter and we're going to send it on uh, with uh, messengers and Paul and some others to let people know really what the apostles have taught but more what they did not teach. Notice this. Acts 15 verse 24. This is that letter. Since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. I want to pause right there. Because there's another great understanding of scripture and God's truth in this verse. The apostles had taught positively. They had stated what the doctrine was. There was the teaching of what the doctrine was. And when they write this letter to correct it. All they do is to remind the people. We've already given you this truth. These fellows that went out. We gave no such commandment. They have gone and taught things we didn't teach. They went beyond our doctrine. They went beyond our way. And instead of doing this point by point refutation, they just said, no, we didn't teach it. They went beyond it. It's not so. That is a powerful point of interpretation for us today. It is important to be God's fellowship and to be God's people. That we stand upon the positive teaching of the apostles, the positive teaching of his word. Why do we teach the doctrine that we teach? Why do we worship in the way we worship? Why do we organize our congregation and our work the way we do? Because we go back to the word of God and we look for positive authority. What has been given us in commands, in directives? What do we see exemplified? What did the early church do that the apostles were leading to do? And let's do that. Let's be that. And let's not go beyond that. And we will find in that fidelity, the commitment to their faith, and not going beyond their faith. 
It will settle disputes as it did in Acts chapter 15. And it will unite the church. Fidelity. So many different scriptures encourage us to this. To understand that there's only one gospel. So hold fast to the gospel. It's not going to be changed by angels. It's not going to be changed by latter day prophets. Galatians chapter 1 verses 6 through 8. Anybody tries to change it, let him be a curse. We are encouraged, hold fast to the apostles' doctrine. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, that's what the early church did. They continued in that doctrine. Doctrine is not a bad word. It just means teaching. This is what they taught. This is the truth communicated. And we learned in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 15 that it is the same truth from the Holy Spirit whether we were sitting there and we heard it by word of mouth or whether they wrote it as Scripture. The letters, what we have is our New Testament. We're encouraged to hold fast to the truth that God's word is truth. And yes, it sanctifies. It sets us apart from the world around us, but that's a good thing. To be different from the world around us, we stand out so that the world can see what? God's grace on display. We are different. And all of this is found written in the scriptures. Written in the scriptures. We see here this wonderful church at Antioch. God's grace is on display in their fellowship. It was a new group together. In their fidelity, they held on to the truth of Christ against external persecution, even internal dispute. Finally, we see God's grace on display in fruitfulness. In Acts chapter 11, and I'm noticing now around verse 24. Acts chapter 11 around verse 24. You see, where the grace of God is, God is multiplying growth, God is strengthening ministry, there is fruitfulness. And for just a couple of minutes, we're going to inspect some of this wonderful fruit of the church in Antioch. Fruitfulness. Well, there's fruitfulness in evangelism. In verse 24, the scripture said this. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, describing Barnabas. And a great many people were added to the Lord. When you go back to verse 20 and verse 21 that we spent a little time in with our first point. You're going to find out where some of those preachers came from who started preaching to these Gentiles the gospel of Christ. But I think it's interesting you're not actually told their name. Isn't that something? There's some of those churches you read about in the Bible and you know that Paul started them because it says his name, right? But we don't know the names of these fellows that because of a terrible persecution go to Antioch and they're preaching and then, and then even beyond the Jews they start preaching to others as well. I think that's fantastic. Churches don't have to be started by apostles. It's the power of the gospel. And the preacher and the teacher carrying the gospel, that's what's significant. It's the blessing of the Lord and fruitfulness, that's what's significant. Large numbers of turn to the Lord in their own community at this church in Antioch. And then Barnabas comes. Oh, now I know somebody's name. And what's he do? He keeps preaching and teaching along with many others and more are added to the Lord. It's so exciting. It's so exciting. You keep reading in the book of Acts and you'll find that this church at Antioch, I think of it as the church between the journeys. Because this was the church that was moved to send the Apostle Paul, to send Barnabas, to send them out on these missionary journeys. They were about evangelism in their own neighborhood and community. But they were about evangelism to the ends of the world. All over the Roman Empire. And God was blessing it. It's fruitfulness. It's a church on mission. When you see a church on mission, you're seeing the grace of God on display. You're seeing a church that's serious about the Great Commission. Because it is the work of the church to seek and save the lost. We are Christ's body on earth. And God is honoring our efforts. We pray for the lost, we invite the lost, we teach and we preach the lost, but it is God who gives the increase. And we see him doing it for this church in Antioch. It's God's grace on display. I'll give you a second area of the fruitfulness, the fruit of discipleship. In Acts chapter 11 and verse 26, Acts 11 verse 26, Barnabas leaves to seek out Saul of Tarsus, and the scripture says in that place he brought him to Antioch, so it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. They taught them. What were they making? Disciples. Disciples of who? Jesus. What do they call these Christ followers? Christians. 
Christians. It's fantastic. Teaching considerable numbers. So many people that, that uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> Barnabas says, too much for me. Let's go get Saul. Let's have somebody else and work this together. But what I love about this is it shows that God isn't done with people once they leave the baptistry. We learn the gospel, we're baptized, we become Christians. And that's as it should be. But that is not the end of a walk with the Lord. It is the beginning of a walk with the Lord. Now they're new creatures. Now they're babes in Christ. And what do they need? They need to be taught. And a great many were taught. The local church has a role to play in the growth and the maturing of converts as disciples of Christ. It is part of our ministry in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2. To take the word and entrust it to the next generation. Pass it on to other who will faithfully teach the word to other people also. The body must grow. Every joint has something to supply. Christians are to mature and to teach others. And it is the work of a local church. We're serious about discipleship here. I wonder if we could, I wonder if we could say the discipleship circle together. Just Has Edwin pounded into our minds enough, right? A disciple is someone who honors God, learns from God, Loves like God, leads others to God, all while abiding in God's word. Y'all did great with that. I didn't even put the circle up there and you knew it. When you see people growing and maturing in Christ, that's God's grace on display. That's God's grace on display. That's the fruit of God. Finally, there's the fruit of benevolence. If you go with me to verse 27 of the chapter. And in these days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them named Agabus stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. This they also did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Who was it that started the church at Antioch? Well, it was actually some Christians who had to leave Jerusalem because of a terrible persecution. Christians who had learned from the day of Pentecost and certainly or, or, or perhaps shortly thereafter about Jesus Christ and his truth and, and they were able to stay in Jerusalem until there was that bad persecution. How is it all these people from all over the ends of the earth could stay together? They didn't have credit cards. Right? You, you made a journey, you made a trip, you had the money that you had. How could they stay together? And we start reading about this incredible generosity among the brethren. In Acts chapter 4 particularly, we found that some of those Christians were even willing to sell their land so that they would have money to give to help the other needy saints so they could stay together a little longer or relieve whatever those needs were. I mean, it's very, very generous. Time's passed now and word gets back to this church in Antioch. There's going to be a terrible famine in Jerusalem. There's going to be some great, great needs there. And look at this. They make their contribution and they send to relieve those needy saints. There are some times we find that providence has granted us much materially so that we can help our brothers and sisters in Christ who have need. Other times we find that we might be the needy ones. I tell you that uh, here lately there's been a number of brothers and sisters in Christ when you call to check up and find them. Like here in our church, they say, well, I'm sick with this or I'm down with this. Do you need anything? And they say, all I need is prayer. All I need is prayer. And I tell you, I'm so encouraged this morning about the power of prayer and when we are praying and do that for one another because some of the people I've been praying for are here this morning. And I'm praising God for that. And it encourages me to keep praying for the others whatever that health malady or issue is that they're facing. Sometimes that's what brethren need. Just pray for me, all right? And we pray. But sometimes it's prayer and a little more. That's what's going on in Jerusalem. Sometimes it's prayer and there might be some resources that are needed, some other type of relief. And what we see here from Antioch is that the church acts benevolently toward the saints and toward the saints today. That God's people know that in the hour of need, the church is there for them. God uses his church to provide and aid his people. 
And when we have opportunities to be there for one another like that, and you, you see the people who are willing to offer their time, offer their prayer, offer their resources, perhaps even great sacrifice, to provide for the brothers and sisters in need, to be there in that hour of need, that's God's grace on display. And sometimes we have the opportunity to receive that grace, and we are so overjoyed. We just want to pay it back or pay it forward. But we know that God has never left us nor forsaken us. And truly he uses his people to minister to his people when they need it. It's so wonderful to look at this church in Antioch and see God's grace on display. See it in fellowship. See it in fidelity. And see it in fruitfulness. Praise God for this church. Makes me think about what this church at Livingston can be here today. If you want to put your Bibles away and put your notes away. The Holy Spirit is telling us about the time... That Barnabas went to Antioch and what he saw there, he beheld the grace of God. Makes me wonder if uh, Luke were writing another book today, and we'll call this one the Acts of the Christians. And a preacher came to Livingston Avenue. How would it be described? Would he say, I see the grace of God here? And I am so glad. I'm humbled at the thought. I'm excited at the thought. Because when I see the church in Antioch, and I, I see what we have all around us. With wonderful brothers and sisters in Christ. And godly elders and dedicated servants and families that love the Lord and want to build one another up. And a heart for people to say, it's not about my name or my fame. But I want people to know that Jesus is Lord and will share that message. I see so much of the grace of God on display in this place. I pray that this church has always puts the grace of God on display. And how about you this morning? Are you a part of the church of God? Are you a part of his church? Know that Jesus is Lord. Do you believe it? Do you trust it? Will you respond in faith to his gospel? Confessing he is the son of God? Turning from sin in your life and being baptized? Being immersed? To be a child of God? To be added to his church? You can do that now. We're going to sing a song. And if you've not put on Jesus in baptism, don't sing the song. Come forward and respond to the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ right now. Come forward if you want to become a Christian. If we can help you with that or any other spiritual need, we invite you to come. And together we stand and sing. Won't you come?